Good morning, Pro-Life Virginia. How are we doing? Oh, we can do better than that. How are we doing, Pro-Life Virginia? Much, much better, much better. Thank you, everyone, for coming out here in this blustery February day to stand for life. What a beautiful day it is to stand for life. Did you know it's the first post Roe Mar Virginia March for Life? I think we can, again, be a little louder. It's the first post Roe Virginia March for Life. Wonderful. All right, my name is Erin Getz, and I am blessed to be the State March Program Director at the March for Life Education and Defense Fund. I am so thrilled to be here with each of you today, and especially thrilled to be here with our host organization and our partner, the Family Foundation of Virginia. Can we give them a hand, please? Woo! Woo! Today we have an incredible lineup of speakers, people with powerful pro-life testimonies and telling us what's happening here in our state house. I'm very excited to share each of them with you today and I'll tell you a little bit more about them as we go on. So to start today's program, I'd like to welcome up Bishop Patrick Rudin from the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. Bishop Wooden is a soul-stirring gospel preacher and an influential voice for God who courageously speaks about the moral and social issues of our day. He has been the pastor of Upper Room for over 34 years and leads with love, compassion, and strength, and sincerity. He takes seriously his responsibility to be a watchman on the wall, keeping his congregants informed so that they will not be deceived. He is also a significant voice in the community known as a voice for the voiceless. Please help me give a warm, warm welcome to Bishop Wooden to open us in prayer. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to stand here with the wonderful people of Virginia on this beautiful day and this, on this historic occasion. And I want to hear you if you agree with me. There are no people like pro-life people. Yeah. Pro-life people are the best people in the world because we're the ones who fight, who sacrifice, who pray, who do what needs to be done so that babies and people can live. Let us pray. Dear God of the Bible, God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are grateful to be here today. Thank you for this glorious day. Thank you for allowing us to gather on these grounds. And as we pray to hollow them, we ask for your presence. We ask for your grace and for your mercy. We're thankful for all of the legislative victories that we've had. We're thankful for the decisions, uh, the, the Dobbs decision from the Supreme Court. And yet, Lord, we realize that there is work to be done. There are hearts to be changed. There are babies to be saved. There are enemies and forces that we must fight against. And with you, oh God, we can do it. We pray, oh Father, that you would use us, cause your face to shine upon us. And God, that next baby, that the, the very next one that is marked for death, wherever that mother is, wherever that clinic is, Wherever, what, whatever room she's in, God change her mind. Change her heart. Let her know that life is the right option and the only option that will be pleasing in your sight. And we pray that you would use every one of us to be witnesses for life, to be influencers, to influence that lady, that mother, that couple, that man, to let the baby live. Let the baby live. Let the baby live. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you, Bishop Wooden. What a beautiful and inspiring prayer. 
I would now like to welcome up to the stage here the Holy Family Academy St. Anne's program from Manassas, Virginia to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. And then following the Pledge of Allegiance, we will welcome Samuel Deal from HEAV Vocalist Group to sing the national anthem. Please help me welcome Holy Family and Samuel Deal. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. I this is a break and I didn't want to hit a side of car. I let this private car to sing. I said, I like that. And it is as for better to see questions at all. Oh, who say can you see? By the dawn's early light What so proudly we hail At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight Oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave through, through the Samuel and to the St. Anne's program from Manassas. Um, joining us next is a very special woman, um, a very powerful and incredible pro-life advocate, um, and I'm very uh, honored to partner with her organization. I would like to welcome Victoria Cobb, the president of the Family Foundation of Virginia, the largest and oldest pro-family advocacy organization in Virginia, where she maintains the mission, vision, and strategies of the organization. In her 18th year as president, she now oversees the work of their legal arm, the Founding Freedoms Law Center. She's also president of the Family Foundation Act Action, a 501c3 that protects families and promotes in re responsible citizenship by Virginians, giving them the tools they need to hold their elected officials accountable, including educating and mobilizing voters in key elections. Please help me welcome Victoria Cobb. It is great to be here today with you. About seven months ago, you and I were at the height of joy in the battle for the unborn. We were rejoicing that Roe was finally overturned in the Dobbs U.S. Supreme Court decision, leaving it to the states, leaving us in the position to protect human life. Some of you have been working towards that moment for decades, and we thank you. Solomon once wrote, for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. The season for celebration is moving into the season for hard work. On the very day, some of us were just up at the U.S. Capitol at the National March for Life. We had Virginia Senate Democrats defeat every effort that came in front of them that would have added protections to our state law. 
A Senate committee defeated a bill that would have defined life at conception. They even defeated a bill that would have said, at least at the point where they feel pain, that should be a place where we protect human life. And they even defeated a bill that would have restricted abortion at least at 24 weeks, at least by that last trimester. They made clear that they want abortion for any reason, at any point in the pregnancy, up and including until the moment of birth, and they want our tax dollars to fund it. And what's more, they're working to try to enshrine that into our state constitution. But you know what? They are out of step with the people of Virginia. In fact, just this month, WPA did a poll of Virginians. This month, and you know what? 60% agreed that at least at 50, 15 weeks where the baby feels pain, at least at that point, we agree, the majority of Virginians agree, we need to protect that human life. You know what can happen to elected officials when they're out of step with the constituents that put them in office? Guess what? They get taken out of office. This group of politicians has another chance. They have another chance to improve the climate for the unborn here in Virginia this very year as they see the Baby Born Alive Act, at least at the moment where an abortion has been botched and a life is in front of us. We want to protect that human life. They have this opportunity. Today is our chance to make our voices heard and for them to see that this matters to Virginians and to get a picture that we are the kinds of people that are going to show up and we're going to take this issue all the way to the ballot box should they persist in doing the bidding of Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. These same legislators also get to decide if they really support any alternatives to abortion. They'll have opportunities to support adoption tax credits. They have opportunities to take the sales tax off of diapers. They can decide if they want to help facilitate other options or if they are only willing to make the abortion industry a profit center. It's up to us. It's been up to us. We've been working for decades. We should know it's not going to happen overnight. It's for us to keep working. But one more thing I want to mention. Some of you may have heard that there's been a little something pro-life up in Southwest Virginia. Yes, that's right. If even if the state doesn't do its job to protect human life, your locality can do this. That's right, Bristol, Washington County, Tazewell, Buchanan, and others are moving to make their localities a safe zone for life. Imagine, yes. Imagine if these legislators come to Richmond and then they go home only to find that their locality has done its job to protect human life. That is something we can all be a part of. If you're interested in learning more about Safe Zones for Life, check out familyfoundation.org. We would love to help partner with you in your locality. But today, let's make them do their job. Thank you for coming out here. Thank you, Victoria. What an inspiring speech. I mean, I'm pretty fired up. Next up, we have an incredible pro-life advocate, Delegate Emily Brewer. She's a child of adoption and a staunch pro-life advocate and has made encouraging adoption over abortion her mission. She has been a strong voice to fight to protect the sanctity of life, and we're so grateful for her pro-life stance. She is the representative of the 64th House District and was first elected in 2017, and we're so excited to have her. And joining her very shortly will be an incredible group of pro-life legislators standing with her. Um, please help me welcome Delegate Emily Brewer. So, so first, I want you guys to look up behind you in that hill, and those are the people, the entire Republican caucus, standing on that hill, standing behind you in every single fight that you have. So let's give them a round of applause. So we'll be brief. We do have to get back to the floor, but we couldn't do it without the people that are standing right behind you that have your back. First, I want to say I'm overjoyed to see the support here today at the Capitol for the value of life. It's an emotional moment for me, but I'm so glad to be able to do it. 
As a child of adoption, I only get to stand before you today because somebody else chose life. Because of that commitment, I got a chance. What that act of love inspired is my lifetime of work and commitment is now dedicated to standing up each and every day for the value, promise, and joy that life brings. What many people fail to realize is that abortion always has two victims. The opportunity for a mother to know unconditional love and a child to have a chance to become a nurse, an artist, maybe a firefighter, or maybe even a legislator. We must join together to create a culture that supports life. We need to end the taxpayer funding. If some had their way, 50 million or more lives would be lost, light that the world would never, ever know. My little girl, Presley, is, uh, she'll be three months old next week, actually. Um, so it's my first time. This is fun. Um, but she's nothing short of a miracle. 26 weeks, I found out that I had two fetal anomalies and that fluid had been detected on her brain. Sorry, this is a lot. I was told that her future and prognosis would not be optimal. On November 10th, Presley arrived in this world contrary to what we feared. All the fluid had dissipated. God had a plan for her, and he has one for so many other children, if they are just given that chance. There are people here at this Capitol that believe her life should have ended at that moment. I cannot and will not accept that answer. And as long as I serve here at this Capitol, I and the people that stand on that hill will stand up and we will fight for the value, the promise, the love that life has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Emily Brewer. What an incredible testimony, not only just her testimony, but what she shared with us about her daughter. I'm so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and let's give another round of applause to our incredible pro-life legislators who are just up that hill that way. Up next, we're going to be joined by the wonderful Felicia Price-Nor, our Vice President of Government Affairs at the March for Life. She brings the collected voice of the pro-life America to Capitol Hill throughout the year, including those who participate in the March for Life. She advocates in defense of the voiceless, seeking federal level protections for the unborn. Before joining the March for Life, Felicia was the Associate Director for the Virginia Catholic Conference. Prior to her work at VCC, Felicia was in private law practice, but left it behind when she felt called to fight against the ultimate injustice of abortion, advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves. Please help me welcome and in inviting to the stage, Felisa Price-Nor. Hello, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Nearly five years ago, I was standing right there on those Capitol sp steps speaking at the first Virginia March for Life. I was lobbying alongside those pro-life members and I'm so happy they joined us here today. I would not have believed that I would be standing here a few years later celebrating something I truly did not believe I would see in my lifetime, a post-Roe America. Nellie Gray, as many of you know, was the founder of the March for Life, and her goal was to see Roe overturned. Well, on what would have been her 98th birthday, on June 24th, Roe v. Wade was overturned. The, <laughs> the Supreme Court on that fateful day returned the power to us, the American people, through our elected representatives, both in our nation's capital and here in Richmond, to protect the unborn. So many pro-life warriors brought us here to this historic moment, including all of you who have marched with us for the past 50 years. Now, what does this mean? What are our next steps? With Roe gone, we are free to chart a new course, and the work is really only just beginning. We must continue to march, not only here in Richmond, but in D.C., and call for state and federal pro-life legislation that protects both mom and baby. Every one of your voices matters. In fact, you have an opportunity right now to let your Virginia General Assembly member know that you're here advocating for life. If you pull out your phones, 
and text VA March to 73075, you can send a message to your delegate that you support the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. This critical legislation will protect vulnerable babies that survive an abortion, providing them with the medical care that they deserve. So again, I'm asking all of you, if you haven't already, to pull out your cell phones and text VA March to 73075. Again, I don't see a lot of you pulling them out, so please pull out your cell phones and text VA March to 73075. Your voice is critical to protect the unborn and to send this message and get educated on this issue. My pro-life journey actually started going to the National March as a small child. My mom, when I was three, four years old, would push me in the stroller through the mud, the sleet, snow, and rain, and instilled in me the sense of justice to be with you here today, to protect the most vulnerable. The compassion and joy and love of the pro-life movement shines through in all of you here today. And I call all of you in this moment to join me on this journey, this pro-life journey, and really really advocate for the unborn. If you haven't already, please go to the Pocahontas building, meet with your Virginia General Assembly members. Go to a committee hearing, testify on behalf of life. They need to hear our voices. They need to see each and every one of your beautiful faces in that room and bring the love that we have for both woman and baby. So please join us, it's critical. Now let's all take our next steps in this moment and protect both mom and baby and march for life. Thank you, Felicia, for that incredible story of your mom pushing you as a young child and instilling in you the, the pro-life movement and what it really means to stand for life. Um, as Felicia said, and I'll say it again for those of you who didn't hear in the back, Text VA March to 73075 to let your legislators know in the State House that you support pro life policies and that you are using your voice and supporting them and choosing those pro life policies. Before I welcome our next speakers, I just wanted to take some time to thank those of you who came very early this morning to defend Virginia's most young and vulnerable citizens to your legislators through the Defending Life Day event. Could you raise your hand if you went to DLD? I'd like to see a show of hands. I see some. I Wonderful, incredible, thank you all. Your voices are so powerful, and we're so grateful for you for getting up early and heading to the Capitol building to use your voice to stand for life. If you didn't get the chance to talk to your legislators, it is not too late. Just to my right over here is the Pocahontas building. That's where all of their offices are, and you can enter on Main Street and sign their book and tell them that you came here to stand for life. If you have just five minutes, that's all it takes. So it would mean so much for them to hear from you and to know that their citizens support pro-life policies. So now I'd like to introduce two incredible fighters for, for life in Virginia and two of the masterminds behind this morning's Defending Life Day advocacy event, Olivia Gans-Turner and Jeffrey Caruso. Olivia currently serves as the president of the Virginia Society for Human Life located here in Richmond, the first organized state pro-life group in the country. She's a familiar face at the General Assembly as VSHL's main lobbyist since 2007. Previously, she has spoken widely on post-abortion syndrome and other abortion-related issues in the U.S. and Europe. In addition to traveling to many college campuses throughout the year to meet with students, she is a frequent witness before legislative bodies where she provides testimony on informed consent laws, parental notification laws, as well as abortion complications. After Olivia, we'll be welcoming Jeffrey Caruso, who is the executive director of the Virginia Catholic Conference, established to advance the mutual public policy interests of the Commonwealth's Catholic bishops and their two dioceses. Originally from Maryland, Mr. Caruso spent two years practicing law in his native state and then more than six years as one of their three associate directors at the Maryland Catholic Conference. In January 2005, he became the first executive director of the Virginia Catholic Conference and opened its office in Richmond. Please help me welcome Olivia and Jeff. All right, everybody, short person coming to the microphone. There we go, all right. 
I want to thank everyone for being here today. I think this is extraordinary. I'm so grateful to those of you who attended our Defending Life Day portion of the day. We believe strongly the partnership, the, the four organizing groups, the two dioceses of, of Richmond and uh, Arlington and Catholic Conference, and the Virginia Society for Human Life. We are not a religious organization. We're non-sectarian. But we were honored to be asked for the second time in a row to partner with them. And now other partner groups, like our friends in CW, Frederick Douglass Inst Leadership Institute, uh, the Students for Life of Virginia. We have so many people who want to get involved. And Defending Life Day, from our perspective, is one of the most critical things that we can do every year. Those of you who came and spoke to your legislators, you did something that Americans can do. You did something amazing. And you know what? They respect you for it. So next year, when we do this again, I hope you'll sign up for the morning portion and come and visit with your legislators. When the march ends, Aaron's right. Just walk in through the Main Street entrance, go upstairs, sign their book, tell your delegate, tell your senator why you were here, that you were here in Richmond today, then go get on your bus. It's going to make a huge difference. Now, you've heard about the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act that Delegate Nick Fritas is carrying, and we know that that bill, it, he's a great guy. That bill's going to come up for a final vote in the House within the next couple of days, then it will be crossover, and then it will face the Senate. The Senate is our nightmare, and it is this place where pro-life bills, and Senator Louise Lucas has said it, they go to die. We have to change that. We need to be aware of where our representatives stand, what they believe in, and what they're willing to do, given the opportunity to protect and provide protective laws for unborn children. There was a lot of tussle this year about pro-life laws coming out of the governor's mansion, and there was a lot of resistance to rational, sensible pro-life laws. Well, several good bills will come out of the House in the next week, and those bills will go forward to crossover. And we're going to have to continue to communicate with our legislators throughout the month of February about those bills and how we want them. If you want more information, you can sign up at vshl.org, vshl.org, Virginia Society for Human Life.org, and get on our mailing list. We have a legislative action center that will keep you alerted. These bills come up fast and furious. The biggest bill, the most terrifying thing that stands before us this year, is another attempt to pass a constitutional amendment to make abortion part of our Constitution, a right to... Exactly. No, 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 is our response. The amendment is not a neutral amendment. It, the amendment will, in fact, enshrine Roe v. Wade into our Virginia Constitution. Now, it is a multi-step process. We probably have the tools to stop it at stage one this year. We stopped it in the House yesterday. But the truth is, they will use that against us for the next year and a half. We need to tell our neighbors and friends what that really means. It's not about reproductive freedom. It's about stopping us from passing a bill to protect babies capable of feeling pain in the womb. It's about stopping us from passing legislation to prevent dismemberment abortion. It's about stopping us from passing bills ultimately to protect babies that have heartbeats. It's about stopping us from passing simple legislation like women's right to know laws so that women like myself who have had abortions get access to accurate information before we make our life and death decision for our child. So the truth is, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Coming out today and marching is a beautiful, brilliant, wonderful, loving thing to do. But I need you. The babies need you. The pro-life movement needs you every day of the year. Here and in your own neighborhoods, to know your legislator, go find their office. Communicate with them. Let them know who you are and where, what you believe is right and wrong about what they did or didn't do during this session. We don't have as many opportunities as the other side has to communicate through the mass media. We don't have their kind of money. But you know what we do have? I know what we have. We have you. We have you. All of you. And I know who you are. I'm waving at friends in this crowd. People that only know me from Facebook, people that have seen me in some other form or format. The truth is, I know you. I know your hearts. I know your soul. I know that whether you come here because you're part of a church or no church, and you believe only in the science that every life begins at conception and therefore should be protected under the law, you're here for the right reason. And I love all of you for stepping up. 
But let's not stop here. Let's make sure that we build to the next step. You are the next step, and we will help you do what you have to do. God bless you all today. Thank you to every organization that is partnering together on this wonderful day. Thank you to all of you for coming out. What a beautiful, beautiful day. To find out more about the Virginia Catholic Conference and to sign up for our network, go to vacatholic.org. Again, that's vacatholic.org. Protecting life in our laws and policies starts with each one of us, and it cannot help but spread because that is what the good news of the gospel of life always does. Many of you spread the good news this morning when you met with your legislators. You urged them to support initiatives that ensure compassionate care and support for children both before and after their birth and for mothers and their families. You urged them to provide compassionate and life-saving care to babies who survive abortion attempts. You urge them to ensure that women considering abortion are provided information about the development of their child and about life-affirming alternatives before they make a life-altering decision. You urge them to stop the practice of paying for abortions with your tax money. And you urge them to oppose a radical and dangerous proposal to add a so-called right to abortion to the Virginia Constitution. Ultimately, Life will prevail because the Lord and creator of life assures us of that. He sends us forth to spread the truth, goodness, and beauty of life. We are privileged to have this mission and responsibility. So again, thank you so much for your powerful witness for life today and every day. Thank you, Olivia and Jeff. Let's give them another round of applause. They're advocating for life every day in our state capitol. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce someone with a very beautiful, strong, and special testimony. I'd like to introduce Stephanie Adkins, who is a staunch advocate for life and an active participant in 40 Days for Life. Her testimony is so powerful, and we know it will move you all because it has moved us so much. We're grateful to Stephanie for her courage and resolution in standing for Virginia's women, born and unborn. Please help me welcome Stephanie Adkins. Thank you. For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When I was 17, I found out I was pregnant and I had just moved to a new state. I didn't really know anybody. So I wasn't sure that I could go and talk to my parents. I just felt so much shame and I didn't want to disappoint them. So I went to my high school guidance counselor and he directed me to an abortion clinic outside of the state I lived in. Because at the time where I lived, you were required to be 18 or have parental permission to have an abortion. So he let me use the phone in his office. He allowed me to cash a check out of school funds to pay for the abortion. He excused me from school and on May 1st, 1998, I drove across state lines to have an abortion. If I had known then what I know now, I would have made a different decision. It is one that I re regret every day, and it has affected my life every day since then. I experienced um, a lot of depression and anger and hatred towards God because I thought that this was something that God had allowed to happen. But in reality, it was a choice that I made and brought upon myself. And so I was angry at myself. But God, he sent his son to earth to become the great redeemer for us all. 
And so even though I experienced a great amount of depression and I did everything I could to basically kill myself without actually doing that through um, drugs and alcohol and promiscuity, really just to numb the pain and so I could function in everyday life with the guilt that I was feeling. God was there alongside me every step of the way. He made sure that I knew that he was there and that when I was ready to reach out to him, he was there with open arms for forgiveness and um, healing. And I want every woman out there in the crowd and across the world to know that Jesus is available to offer you that same healing and redemption. That if this is part of your story, it's not the end. You are not defined by having made that choice. I also want you to know that laws um, make it possible for people to get the abortions, you know, come to different states. We, I live in Tennessee, and so we have people coming from Tennessee into Virginia to seek abortions. And it's the job of legislators to help young women and girls um, make the correct decision by making laws that prevent them from being able to do that. So thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, Stephanie, for stepping boldly up here and sharing your powerful witness of, of hope and healing. Um, I know it's a message that we all need to hear in this movement, that there is hope and there is healing. Next, I'd like to welcome someone who's dedicated to the cause for life, someone in our administration, the wonderful Attorney General, Jason Miares. <laughs> Attorney General Miares is the 48th Attorney General of Virginia, the first Hispanic American elected to statewide office in Virginia, as well as a child of an immigrant to serve as Attorney General. Before becoming Attorney General, he served in the Virginia House of Delegates for three terms, and he worked as a prosecutor in his hometown of Virginia Beach as Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney. As Attorney General, he is focused on improving public safety and supporting businesses growth across the Commonwealth. Attorney General Miares is a proud graduate of James Madison University <laughs> and the William and Mary School of Law. And he still lives in Virginia Beach with his lovely wife, their three daughters, and their golden retriever. Please help me welcome Attorney General Miares. It is amazing to be here. I want to first of all thank all the students. You truly are the pro-life generation, so thank you for being here. I want to thank all the crisis pregnancy centers that have been attacked, both verbally and sometimes physically. Thank you for what you do standing in the gap. You know, you live in a remarkable time when you have a United States Senator, Elizabeth Warren, who said we should literally shut down every crisis pregnancy center in this country. And I guess my message for her is, if you try to do that in Virginia, I'll see you in court. But I'd like to share with you all a very personal story. Uh, the first time I've ever shared this publicly was when I visited at First Care Women's Health in Manassas. I was a young man, 25 years old, living in Richmond, and I got a phone call from my cousin, Louisa. I didn't grow up with sisters, so my cousins, she was my first cousin, uh, they were like my sisters. And she called me up and she said, cuz, I'm pregnant and I'm scared. She was just a year out of high school, and untragically, it's too often the case, her boyfriend didn't want the baby. And she didn't know where to go. So she drove up to see me in Richmond. She lived in North Carolina. She stayed with me on my couch. We had a lot of late night conversations about life, her problem was so many of her friends were telling her to end the pregnancy. At the end of the day, she gave 
one of the most beautiful gifts, one of the bravest gifts a young woman can ever give. She gave the gift of life. And then she gave away that beautiful gift, that little boy named Nathan, to a loving family that could give that young boy a life that she couldn't. Tragically, a number of years later, Louisa got diagnosed with breast cancer. And after a very difficult struggle, she passed. I got to speak at her funeral. And I talked about her legacy. And her most amazing legacy was the fact that she gave away her young son, Nathan, to a new family to raise him. And I was able to share the bravery that she showed. After the funeral, I was at the reception, reminiscing about Louisa's life, in which I got a tap on the shoulder. I turned around. There was a young man standing there. And he said, hello, I'm Nathan. That was the first time I got to meet him. He's a remarkable young man. He's now studying to his goal is to be an EMT so he could save life. When I was inaugurated last January in the steps of Mr. Jefferson's Capitol right there, I had Nathan there on those steps behind me to remind me of the incredible brave choice Louisa made. Thank you for everyone that is here standing up for dignity. We also just heard recently, right before me, that remarkable story from Stephanie. I also want to be, be clear as, as the pro-life message is one of compassion. And there have been some voices in this country saying we should prosecute women who make the decision to have an abortion. That is not right. I could, I could tell you that I believe in protecting babies and women no matter what choices they make. And I agree with the March for Life, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Susan B. Anthony List, the Virginia Society for Human Life, and so many other pro-life organizations that we should not punish and prosecute women seeking abortions. We need to focus on supporting those charities and groups that work with those struggling mothers every day, those, those volunteers that stand in the gaps exactly like those crisis pregnancy centers, those quiet heroes that every day do so much they don't get the recognition they deserve. In my office, in the Attorney General's office, I have a sign. And anybody who's in the House of Delegates, which I used to serve, remembers this sign. It was a sign we put on our desk when there was a vote up on a bill, a late-term abortion bill. And it was a sign that every member in our caucus put forth. And it says just three simple words that I think sums up why we're here today. Life is beautiful. That's why we're here. Thank you all. It's an honor to be your Attorney General. God bless you. Let's hear it for our Attorney General, Jason Miares. What an incredible witness to life our Attorney General is in his powerful story of his cousin Louisa. Um, we are so fortunate to have an Attorney General who is fighting for life each and every day here in the Commonwealth. We're so grateful for him to joining us for today in Virginia. To round out today's events, I'd like to welcome to the podium my bishop, His Excellency Bishop Michael Burbage, who is also... Woohoo! <laughs> He is also, if you haven't heard, the newly elected chair of the Committee of Pro-Life Activities at the USCCB. <laughs> I'd also like to welcome up this diocese bishop, His Excellency Bishop Barry Nestow of the Diocese of Richmond. The two of them will come up for some remarks and a closing prayer. Please help me welcome Bishop Burbage and Nestow. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's so great to see all of you here, especially to see so many of my young friends here. Thank you for your incredible witness and zeal. Honored to share this platform today with so many wonderful speakers who offered such powerful words and inspiring witnesses. 
I am honored to be with my brother Bishop, Bishop Nestout, and be assured, my friends, Catholic friends, and friends of all denominations and communities, be assured that all the bishops throughout this country, in solidarity with our Holy Father, Pope Francis, are tireless in our defense of the sacredness of all human life, especially the vulnerable and the unborn. We will be tireless in our work to bring an end to abortion and to oppose anything pr proposing funding, federal funding for abortion. We are united, and I know we are united with all of you. Thank you. It is an honor for, to be here in this historic State March for Life to pray, to witness, to advocate with all of you. For many years, pro-lifers have been unwavering in reminding our nation about the sanctity of all human life, our commitment to stopping the evil of abortion, which ends the life of a precious child and deeply wounds the child's mother. This year, with the Dobbs versus Jackson women's health decision, states like Virginia now have the opportunity and sacred duty to protect innocent preborn children and to help mothers in need. As you have heard, our work is only just beginning. We must remain vigilant and tireless in praying for and fighting for legal protection of unborn children until every child is safe in Virginia and across the nation. And this love and protection extends to women in need. It is true, we walk with mothers, we walk with women in need, we walk with families in need at every moment, and we'll do everything to assist and to support, to guide, to counsel, and to provide them so that they can say yes to life. The future of the pro-life movement in the Commonwealth relies on God's grace and your tireless efforts. We have seen and we have heard today that God blesses our work when we strive to do what is his will, and that is the protection of his children. Your voice, your energy, your devotion to speak up for the defenseless in need is needed more now than ever. It's true, friends. Our work is just beginning, and we will begin very shortly and bring to our commonwealth such a powerful witness to the truth in love. God bless all of you. I want to thank all from the Catholic community throughout the Diocese of Richmond and Arlington, all those who are here in such great numbers beautiful presence and witness to life. So grateful for that and seeing that witness expressed here this morning and this afternoon. And a shout out to Father Chris and all the folks at St. Anne's in Bristol, all those who are here, thanks for like a great work and defensive life that you guys continue to do, thank you. I'm, I'm asked to give a prayer, let us pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of all creation. Through your goodness, we live in this great land that you have so richly blessed. Help us to recognize that our blessings all come from you and remind us to share these same blessings with others, especially those who are our most vulnerable, the unborn infants in the womb. Help us to be generous, generous, just, and open to your will, to welcome and protect innocent life, to shelter mothers who are alone, anxious, and homeless, Help us to act toward our neighbor in justice and peace. As we have experienced your justice showered upon us, your peace in our hearts, as well as your generosity and providential care, so may we always act towards others. Grant that all who believe in your Son may proclaim the gospel of life with honesty and love to the people of our time. Obtain for them the grace to accept the gospel as a gift ever new the joy of celebrating it with gratitude throughout their lives, and the courage to bear witness to it resolutely in order to build, together with all people of goodwill, the civilization of truth and love to the praise and glory of God, the creator and lover of life. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.